Hello, and welcome to the very first episode of What The Folk podcast, hosted by yours truly, Graham Falk. I couldn't have hoped for a better guest for the very first podcast episode, one of probably the most famous names in British football at the moment. We've got current Arsenal and Lionesses forward, Beth Mead, in the hot seat today. How are you doing, Beth? Are you well? Hi, yeah, I'm good, I'm good, thank you. Thanks for having me. It's all right. Um, it's an absolute pleasure, to be honest. But first and foremost, for those unaware, you're currently out with injury. How's the rehab going? Is everything all right? Yeah, it's kind of okay. I mean, sometimes rehab's actually harder than training most times, but um, <laughs> no, it's going well. I've been training hard, just trying to get myself back as quickly as possible. So good. hopefully that's the plan, and hopefully I can be back on the pitch as soon as possible. Cause yeah. The yeah, very much Arsenal so. are struggling at the moment, so we need every play we can get, really. Yeah, you missed the, you missed the cup final with injury, unfortunately. That must have been a bit of a yeah. blow, I imagine. So yeah, no, it was. It was a bit difficult. Um, I mean, I played every game leading up to it, so... Yeah. To watch the girls in the final and not being able to help them is always quite hard. It's hard to watch sometimes, but I suppose that's all I've ever done in my life because I'm not that talented at football, but there you go. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm going to take you all the way back to sort of as far back as I can, I suppose, to, to begin with. Um, yeah. All the way back as, as, as we can really go. But I think my first question I would ask is everyone has that moment where they maybe first entered a football ground and where they became a fan of the game. But what were your earliest memories of sort of playing football and then I suppose falling in love with it? I mean, I was six when I first ever started. I played on a, I mean, Hinderwell's my local village and I went to a local Saturday morning session with the boys there. Um, I mean, I loved it from minute one, from playing, you know, I played with no fear. Um, I was told, my mum was told the boys are quite rough, so we should be okay. And <laughs> when my mum returned, they kind of said, oh, I'd best more rough than most of the boys. But <laughs> yeah, when I'm on a football pitch, you know, I just play football and don't think about anything else. And that's when I'm at my most happiest, I guess. And since being six year old and playing and, yeah, growing into my football from there, I guess it's it's always been there and it's been a passion of mine. Did you have a particular team that you supported when you grew up, or did you go more for the players when you were young? Um, my dad's a United, Man United fan, so I actually support Man United. But <laughs> I, I won't hold it against I you, I promise. <laughs> <laughs> my uh, uncle is a Middlesbrough fan, and obviously that was a local ground, obviously Premier League at the yeah. time. And I went to a lot of games with my uncle and my uh, dad and people just to watch the football, I guess, and get that different atmosphere of actually being at games. So I did see a lot of uh, Middlesbrough players when I was a young girl. So it was a quite interesting, and I suppose I hadn't planned this question, but just kind of touching on recent times, um, obviously the Lioness was playing at the Riverside. Was that kind of a was that a bit of a weird one for you, if the, your first memories were at the Riverside? <clears throat> yeah, it was. You know, I think I was I, when I came out before the game started, um, I said to some of the girls, that's where I used to sit when I used to come and watch behind the <laughs> girl over there. Um I mean, yeah, it was the closest place I've played to home, so I had a lot of fans there, a lot of people who came and watched me, so it was quite special for me to be able to play there and get a chance. And, um, I mean, the North East loves the football, so it was nice to have a game up north, and, you know, the England team's got a lot of Northern players in, in the squad, so, yeah, it was nice for a number of us. But I've been told that you were quite a handy cricketer as well when you were young. What's the story behind that? <laughs> um I mean, I just I just love sport, really. I played hockey, I did cross-country, I did athletics, whatever I could do. And my local village um, were low on a, in the men's team. Well, the same men's team, women could play, but um, they were low one night, so I said I would go and play. And my brother was bowling, and I managed to catch two balls from him. So it was called the mid show that, the, that day. Um, <laughs> but no, yeah, I just, I just enjoyed doing any sport particularly. Were you one of those people that were just really lucky and talented at everything, where you could just play everything and you just kind of had a choice? In sport, yes, probably. <laughs> Academically, I had to work a bit harder than I did at sport, but, yeah. you know, um, yeah, I was quite lucky that I got the sport gene, you know, and everything I did. I I mean, I enjoyed doing it, you know. I wasn't one of them kids who accidentally forgot the PE kit, so, <laughs> yeah, whatever. No, I loved it. That was my favourite. I mean, that was my favourite class when I was at school, and I couldn't wait for that, so... So I spoke to um I spoke to Jill Scott, obviously a Lioness's teammate and yeah. someone obviously who I look up to as well, especially being from Sunderland. Um, but with Jill, she I think she was really quite good at athletics. She was mentioned that she was a really good runner. Um, yeah. So I asked her this question. I suppose I would I would ask you the same as well. But she chose football um as the kind of route she wanted to go down. I think it's fair to say it was the right option. What made yeah. you choose football as opposed to maybe say cricket or, or other sports or something like that? I think when I played football, it's just an in, like it's an indescribable feeling. Like I just 
don't think about anything else. I love what I'm doing. I love everything about the game. And Yeah, I was pretty talented at it. But yeah, from the minute go, I always knew it was going to be football. I enjoyed doing other things, but the culture around it, uh, the feeling of playing when I was on the pitch just made it quite easy to make that decision for football in the end for me. So, you, I mean, as we can see, and you've mentioned before, so you are quite talented at the sport, um, so therefore it was the right choice, much like Jill's, but who was the first person to spot your, your sort of talents at a grassroots level that maybe wasn't a family member or a friend or someone who watched the games? Who was like the first coaches to kind of go, hang on, you've got something there? I called Philly when I used to play with um, yeah. Saturday morning. He told me to go towards Middlesbrough, which had um, a lot more opportunities for girls at that time yeah. and I went to a place in Middlesbrough Academy and it was literally like two nights a week um, and I went yeah I basically went I went there and it was very clicky at the time you know the girls mm-hmm. all knew each other and I did I actually at first didn't enjoy it you know I played the football and then the bits on the side were a bit frustrating for me because yeah so I, I didn't enjoy my time during the academy stage yeah um, but a man used to come and watch her. There was a balcony where they could watch her over, and he said, "Oh, she's a good little footballer. Why don't you bring her to our team in Middlesbrough?" Which at the time were called California Girls. Um, yeah. That was because the man who owned it lived on California Road, but it was based in Middlesbrough. <laughs> no American connections, no. <laughs> no American connections there, no. Um, and then, yeah, I just went to them, and I was. I think I got a perception of uh, how. The girls were, so I actually wanted to play for the boys' team. You know, I was used to playing with yep. boys, and that was my comfort zone. Um, yeah, I was doing... I went to the boys' team, the girls' team were actually there, but I actually went and played with the boys and played with them till I was from, like, the age of 10 to 12 in a boys' league, and then finally worked my way to play for, a, yeah, the girls' team there. And then middle of, it was Centre of Excellence. I think it's RTC, they call it now, but when it I was is, there, yeah. Centre of Excellence then. They made the rule that you couldn't play for a club and them, only one or the other. So, obviously, I knew I was going to get development through the Centre of Excellence better. So, yeah, I decided to move on to there. But I would say the first person would be a guy called, um, yeah, Dave Scott, who brought me to the California club. And then, obviously, Mm -hmm. everything spiraled a bit more from there. Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah, you mentioned before about um, the two nights a week. Was was that at Eston then, or was it somewhere different at that point? Yeah, the Eston Leisure Centre. Yeah, oh, so same place as where Middlesbrough women obviously train at the moment, I think, on a Tuesday. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I think it's now called the, the MFC Foundation or something along that line. Ah, uh, OK. Yeah, um, yeah, and the rest was next to it where I trained with the California team. Yes, that's right. I think I think so anyway. Yeah, I, I imagine that would probably be the setup. And as you say, it's now changed away. You've got the, the Centre of Excellence is now um, the, the RTC. Um, who's it who looked after you at the Centre of Excellence? Did you have sort of different coaches or was it one specific Yeah, person? I had a guy called Andy Cook. Yeah. Um, he actually is in charge of... At Forest? Not Forest? Or yeah, Cork yeah. County women, one or the other. Yeah, great bloke. Um, great bloke. Yeah, he, he, yeah, I really enjoyed working with him, and he was great for me, and told me, uh, yeah, to strive for what I could. And I obviously moved on from Sunderland from there, but I, I've actually kept in touch with him since, and still speak to him on, yeah, a little a basis. He's got a fantastic sort of slick back haircut at the moment. I don't know whether you've seen it. We've seen him recently. Oh, <laughs> I've seen pictures. I don't know. <laughs> I'm biased. I've got the same haircut, so there you go. Oh. Um, I know, I know. For my sins. Um, so I suppose when you're growing up in a, in a grassroots level, you've mentioned before it was a lot of it was just enjoyment, I suppose, essentially. And I think that is for a lot of people when you first start. Um, but then people started noticing your talents and things like that. You know, when you're young, do you, do you kind of work out a position that you want to play? Because the amount of people that I've spoken to that have actually changed position sort of halfway through their progression, did you always know you wanted to be a forward or were you kind of different positions? I mean, as a kid, I enjoyed scoring, and actually, yeah. I played number nine all my career. Literally, from whenever I started, I always played the number nine and striker role until I came to Arsenal. And then, yeah, I've played on the wing the last two years here, so I've adapted myself a little bit. But no, I've always known I wanted to be attacking, and that's what I'm doing now. And another thing as well that you touched on, and again, it's I think it happens probably less so with players coming through now as opposed to maybe players that I've spoke to who have sort of progressed through academies and things like that. But you said you always enjoy playing sort of against the boys. Um, these days, it almost feels like there's a lot more girls that can actually have girls teams. You can play against girls sort yeah. of specifically. Was it almost you enjoyed playing more against them more because um, was, there was more boys playing football? Was there like less girls playing when you were young? 
Yeah, the path was when I was young. I mean, there wasn't many. The girls team that had one, but there wasn't a lot of girls, so the training sessions weren't great. Where so, I mean, for me, I'm glad I got that opportunity to play with the boys because it probably developed me as a player a lot quicker than I would have if I was playing with the girls at the time. So I'm grateful I chose that decision. But yeah, it was mostly because the uh, pathways were probably not there when when I was younger. Yeah. And you've obviously, you, you were at Middlesbrough. I think Middlesbrough, as you said before, was like your local club yeah. at that time. And you've come through the RTC. You've worked with a few different coaches, Andy, um, I've sort of named. But then you hit, so it was, I think it was 16. I could be right. Yeah, I think it was 16 when you, you yeah. sort of moved to Sunderland. So was there ever an opportunity to go to other clubs? Because like, I know these days, I don't know what it was like when you were coming through, but I know with Middlesbrough, at the, at, like at the moment, if you're through the RTC, I think you've got like Faye Dale, who's obviously just came through currently from RTC towards the Middlesbrough first team. She's 16. Yeah. Was it very like a similar pathway because you were seen as like one of the more talented players in the region? Did you have a little bit more choice? To be fair, I didn't really have that many at the time. You know, I uh, got picked up for Sunderland because I played against them in a centre of excellence game and scored a hat trick. And the the women's manager was there actually that day, so he said to me to come along and have a little go and see how I felt. So at the time there probably wasn't many options, but I was playing at centre of excellence level, so mm-hmm. it was hard for big. I mean, the bigger clubs weren't really had scouts or anyone watching around then, so it just happened to be coincidence that the Sunderland manager seen me, and yeah, I went there as soon as I t- when I turned sixteen. Who's the Sunderland ladies manager at the time? Mick Mulhern. Mick Mulhern, fantastic. Actually, funnily yeah. enough, um, just literally text him. I've got him coming on as a guest in a few weeks, so I think it's probably worth touching on Mick Mulhern. I think everyone I've ever spoke to that's been from the northeast um, and involved with the Lionesses always mentions Mick Mulhern. How how good of a coach is Mick? Do you know what? He, I think he just has an eye for talent. You know, he got me in as a sixteen-year-old and played mm-hmm. me and started me my first game I ever got there. And I owe a lot to him. You know, he's a great. Is a great coach, and he had a lot of belief in players that I believed in. So, there's so many players that have been brought through from sort of the northeast under his guidance. Um, yeah, are you surprised he's not had more of like an impact because he's at Heaven, I think, at the moment, assistant manager. Are you surprised he's not continued in the women's game and maybe sort of even grown even further than he, he had done? Um, yeah, I think so. I mean, yeah, he had a lot of impact on a lot of us that they were at the Lionesses now. You know, the likes of Jordan, Lucy, Steph, Jill, Demi. Lucy Stan, like, we've all had a big influence under him, and no, I think we owe a lot of credit to him, you know, and yeah, I guess, I don't know, maybe he could, he could, he could, he should get a little bit more credit, but yeah, yeah you know, he, he's that type of man who doesn't expect or need it, so. Yeah, from my experience, he's very, yeah. very humble in, yeah. in that, he's quite and humble, think. yeah, he is, and. Yeah, he's always told us our football did the talk and he just helped us along the way, but he probably helped us a lot more than he thinks he did. Yeah, he's almost like it's almost like an acknowledgement that he that that's his job and it it is what it is, I suppose, isn't it? Sometimes. Yeah, yeah I think so. Um does it ever feel like, you know, it's almost come with the North East, there's, there's so many players. As you said before, there wasn't too many scouts around when you were younger and you were coming through and things like that from maybe the bigger clubs. But then you look at the Lionesses team now, and I think you, you'll, have, you'll have known about it being one of the players, but a lot was spoke mm-hmm. about, about how many players came from the North East. But yeah. why is it, do you think, the North East has such a success rate and like a production reel of talented players that come out of England and end up going to play for England Lionesses? Um, I think I was joked on saying it was in the water, but um, <laughs> Jill said know, that <laughs> the, the love of football in the North East is just, I think, is very different. And communities as we would have liked, but yeah, there's a lot of girls that shined, and they probably had the right guidance at the right time. And Sunderland was a great club. Like it's a shame to have seen them go down so many leagues recently, but. Yeah. I hope they're doing well at the moment. I hope they get themselves back to where they belong because, yeah, the talent pool that they can get through and the coaches that they have there can do that. Yeah, I mean, they're, they're doing fantastic at the moment and I think that the, probably the most beneficial thing, or the thing I can take from something at the moment is that even though they did get that demotion, they've kind of put that to the backs of their minds and it's all about coming yeah. forward now. But um, talking about keeping an eye on, you know, your past and stuff like that, I, I believe, um, and I've got some privy privy uh, information of this but I believe that you still keep in touch with some of the Middlesbrough players at the RTC I think Daisy Stoke will be probably the one I'm, I'm talking about here but 
how important yeah. do you think it is like players like yourself or players that have came from academies and they've progressed and they've, they've made it professionally how important do you think it is to be a role model to girls that are coming through and f- or following a similar path to yourself yeah no I think it's bigger from it's you know Daisy followed me from actually a young age when I was only like 17 18 at St London she really yeah took a shine to me as a player then before I'd actually even done anything so yeah I mean Daisy comes from Whitby so she's a She's a home girl like me, you know, and uh, I want, I want, I always wanted to support her and be there for her whenever she needed that. And yes, yeah, she's following the same route as me, but it's nice for her to see that it's possible to where we, where we've come from and where she's building through from Middlesbrough. Um, that it's possible to get to whatever level she wants to get if she's willing to work hard for it. And I think I've always spoke to her about that thing. Like your talent alone takes so far, but hard work gets you the rest of the way. Yeah. Absolutely. And I think when it comes to sort of players these days as well, and you mentioned before, it's great to see that play, like players who are 15, 16 can make it. Um, who would have been the players that you would have looked up to when you were sort of maybe her age, 15, 16, that you looked at and said, well, I can, I can aim to that level. And have you played alongside any of them, actually? Um, what, some of the middles for girls. Just from football in general. So like maybe when you were young, like if there was one player, so say like... Uh, for Daisy, the person look up to is yourself. Same place, same pathway, same sort of. Oh um, uh, yeah, yeah. Who would have um, Who would have been yours? And do you know what? Mine actually is funny. We joke about it now. Is Jordan Jordan Nob? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, she went to Middles Centre of Excellence, and she was always in the age group above me, which she was known as a player who was playing for like England youth age groups at the time, and yeah. a big talent. And yeah, I aspired to be like her, and I followed her pathway through Middles. But and then actually, she went to Sunderland. Yeah. which I did after her. And then obviously I went to Arsenal like she did, so I would probably say Jordan was my player who I probably looked up to then. Sounds like you're just following her now, though. <laughs> Basically, I told her, I, I joked on that I was a stalker and I'm just following her, really. It's not football. <laughs> well, you're both doing all right, to be fair. So you, you, it, it's worked out in a way. Um, yeah, I think <laughs> so. I suppose it's a really long-winded question that I'm going to ask. Well, not long-winded. I suppose it's a long answer you could give because there's so many different avenues we could go down with it. So I'll make it as sort of basic as I can. But I think the women's games grew massively over the past few years, like yeah. hugely. Um, but there's still areas where it can grow and things like that. So I suppose probably quite an important question for me to ask. But what are your personal hopes for the future of the women's game? What would you like to see over, say, the next five to ten years? I mean, I've seen such a jump since I started playing. Um which is was amazing, you know. I'm full. I'm in a league that's the top league in England. I'm playing full time football, and actually, everyone in that league now is full time. Yeah. You know, there's so many barriers to be broken down. You know, we're lucky enough at Arsenal that uh, we're, we're provided and supported enough by the men, but not all clubs have that. So I think the support there from either the men's group or need need to kind of be there. Um, you know, attendances we're starting to get them up a little bit, but yeah. We, we've we played in a couple of, you know, this season uh, men's stadiums and got bigger crowds. So I guess pushing for bigger stadiums to get them bigger crowds there is is a big one uh, moving forward in the women's game. It's been fantastic for me personally because I'll, I'll openly admit we... Um... For those who don't know, I'm at currently at university, currently studying for um, a master's degree and a diploma. And one of the, the tests that we have, we had to do a match report, watch a 90 minute game that we weren't we, we weren't aware what it was going to be and had to produce a 200 word match report within five minutes of the full time whistle. Thankfully for me, it was the England Portugal game where you got the winner. So as soon as I sat down and the yeah. game came up, I thought, fantastic. I know exactly what happened here. I know the lineup. I know who scores. Um, so thanks for that. Yeah. You're helping me pass my master's degree. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> um, yeah. It's one question that, obviously, today's the first episode, but I do want to bring this question, I suppose, into every single episode. Um, so I'll end on this one. I've got a couple of Twitter questions from people that you may or may not know. Um, okay. But pick your dream five-a-side team featuring only players that you've played with or against. Oh, okay. Um, okay. Goalkeepers, Barry Van Vendendaal. Yep. Uh, right back, Lucy Bronze. Yeah, it has to be. Yeah. Um, centre half, Seth Horton. Yeah. Um, left back. No, do you know what? I'll go to. <laughs> I'm going to go to at the back. Yeah. I'm going to put uh, Daniel van der Donk in my midfield. Yeah. 
and Kim Little. And then I'm going to go Vivian Miedemar up top. It's not a bad five-a-side team, is it? It's not too bad, is it? it? Do all not right. too shabby. No, not too bad at all. Surprised didn't pick yourself, though. Kind of disappointed. Yeah, I'm on the bench. <laughs> I'm on the bench in that team. Decent, decent option. Decent option off the bench, yeah. I have to admit. You know, impact player. Impact, yeah, yeah. I think that. that yeah. See, I'm meant to be the one with the, the good quotes and stuff like that, and you beat me with that already. Um, yeah. So, Twitter questions. Um, we've got a couple, uh, four in total. Some of them, one of them is from, you may know her, Katie. Katie. Marillo. Marillo, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, she needs to know what your Nando's order is. Uh-huh. Very important question, apparently. See, they're gonna people aren't gonna like what I'm gonna say because <laughs> I'm a pl- I'm a pl- plain Jane girl. I can't do spice. I have plain butterfly chicken, and I then I will spice. have a side of halloumi, yeah, chips and mash. And then if it's a naughty naughty day, I would have garlic bread as well. The fact that you're saying that when you said no spice, you did disappoint me there. But on the flip side, you said sweet potato I'm mash. I'm gonna say it. Does- yeah, it's going to disappoint a few people, but I can't handle mash up wish I could. But sweet but potato can. mash is pretty decent. You've kind of yeah. redeemed yourself there, to be fair. Maybe I could put a bit of spice on it and then cool it down sweet potato mash, but... Yeah, that kind of works. It's not, <laughs> yeah, I'm, you know, I'm going to try that. I'll get back to you on it. Um, so one of the questions we have is, do you have any lucky charms or pre-match rituals? <laughs> I re- no, I don't. Um, I'm not too. I mean, I believe in that you make your own future. So I'm not really too predictable. And, um, yeah, about anything like that. I'm superstitious. Uh, if I, I don't think about it all the time. But maybe I put my left shin pad on before my right. But that's not an official thing. I think it's because I get my ankle strapped that I put the one on first. <laughs> yeah. But at the end, nothing there. Uh, superstitious. Another one. Um, quite a good question, actually. Um. They'd like to know because they said you're always as posi- You're always positive. Are you as positive yeah. as you seem? If and if so, is that part of your personality, or did you have to learn to stay positive? Um, I think as you grow up, you know, um, as a footballer, you, you have some knockbacks or you have some injuries, or for whatever reason, something happens in your life. That it, I mean, as a kid, I probably didn't deal with things as much. You know, I mean, when I first moved to Arsenal, I struggled when I came here for two weeks. Uh, mm-hmm. But just kind of being out of my comfort zone, you know. I lived at, I lived in Newcastle, but I lived away from family. But it's it, just a different way of life down here. So I mean, you you learn as you grow you grow up and how you mature as a footballer. But I mean, if you ask anyone, I'm quite a bouncy and bubbly person, and I'll always stay positive. You know, I know like. Right now, yeah, my knee's not the greatest thing that I wanted to happen, but yeah, it's part and parcel of football and I've got to accept that and I can't change that now. So, you know, being negative about it isn't going to help my recovery or my rehab and get me on the pitch quicker. So, yeah, I do believe in being positive. Yeah, fab mindset. Yeah, yeah. And you talked about, um, funnily enough, you talked about how you have quite like a, a banterous nature, I suppose. Um, there's some fantastic yeah. gifts of you on Twitter at the moment, which have come in really handy this morning when I've been asking for questions. So, um, thanks yeah. for that again. Um, Mickey asked, and this is probably quite a good question based on what we've discussed, but what advice would you give your teenage self? My what self? Your teenage self, or when you were younger, oh, if my you prefer. Self. Um, yeah, I think as a teenager, I, uh, I uh, thought my talent would get me so far, but you soon learn that, you know, people catch up to your talent with hard work, and I think now I've had to step up my game and get to the next level through hard work and you know do, doing them little bit of extra things every time um I go out onto the pitch or the training pitch or whatever it may be so I would always say that work hard and everything and always get yourself a little bit of a head start of everyone else because they, they will catch up to you in the end yeah with um another question I think it's this is something I've noticed myself because I'll openly admit I've only been involved within women's football over the, maybe the past two years um, so probably yeah. around the same sort of time that there's been a, or during the time there's been a relative growth due to the World Cup and things like that but I've noticed there can be fans that travel from so far flung um, from everywhere really they don't necessarily have to support say Arsenal or England they just want to be there to support so how does it feel to have like a fan base that sometimes will travel from different parts of the world not just different parts of the country just to come and see you play football 
Yeah, no, it's, it's quite surreal for me, you know. Um, one of my friends messaged me the other day that their kid had gone to World Book Day as me. Mm-hmm. So little things where people, I mean, love you as a person and a player, whatever it may be, yeah. It's still quite surreal for me that people do that, and I'm very thankful for the people that have supported me uh, now and and before. I think it's fantastic when you see maybe because I I obviously grew up watching a lot of men's football, um, but yeah. I love how at the end of every single like game that I've been to within the women's game, and I know the crowds are a little bit smaller compared to maybe what you get in the Premier League, but I love how that's uh. so accessible. It's so accessible. It feels like a community thing within the women's game at the moment. And yes, it has grown and it is changing, but it very much feels that like it's a community thing, which I think is, I think is kind of what football should be. Yeah, it should very no, much so be about so. that. I think, um, yeah, no, the women's game is very um, family oriented. You know, after every game, whether we win or lose, we all the girls or a big handful of the girls always go around and sign and take pictures after every game and. Fans wait out for us after even when we've got changed and had a shower and stuff. And yeah, we wouldn't be there without them. There wouldn't be an atmosphere without fans. So we owe a little bit to them too. And I think, uh, yeah, the men's game's not that personal, which is quite nice touch about the women's game that you do get. Yeah, it's a refreshing attitude. It's really lovely to see for a fan of, like, I suppose yeah. both, both, well, it's one sport, but you get where I'm coming from. Um, the final question I've got is a really good question, I thought. Yeah. Um, and it very much touches on sort of your own personal career. Um, after being knocked back, from England so many times when you were at Sunland and obviously your goal scoring record at Sunland was fantastic um, yeah. how did it finally feel not just to make your debut but become one of the Lionesses most popular and most key players yeah um, I mean it was a long process for me and I was working hard as a player um, I was doing everything I possibly could at Sunderland yeah I found it a tough area you know I was, I was top scorer in the league I was playing really well and the manager at the time um just wasn't really picking me or involving me in the squad and yeah it was it was hard for me but it made me more eager and made me made me want it more and yeah the moment when I got called up and Phil spoke to me and then I managed to get my debut was a great feeling and yeah to be involved in the squad now is just a dream come true and yeah I guess that that moment of not being picked and not getting that chance probably made me more excited and yeah more determined to get there. Beth, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you very much. No, thank you very much. Thanks for having me. Um, good luck with the rehab. Hope to see you back in the kitchen as soon as possible. Um, but yeah, absolute much. pleasure. Thank you so much.